Hey, folks, Damian Mason coming at you. Before we hop into another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture, I want to tell you about Pattern Ag. Pattern Ag is a company that has pioneered predictive soil analytics. You know, we always treated diseases and pests after they were already in the field, when they were already causing us a problem. But what if you can do this proactively through predictive soil analytics? Pattern has a technology that through their technology, you can say, oh, here's the likelihood that I'm going to have soybean cyst nematode. Here is the prediction on how bad of a risk I face for sudden death syndrome or corn rootworm and a whole bunch of other diseases and pests. When you know what your risk factor is, you can more efficiently and proactively treat for the disease. You can do this by going to pattern.ag and figuring out what your risk factors are through predictive analytics. That's right. Go to www.pattern.ag and then get a hold of your Pattern Ag representative to help you do predictive analytics on your farming operation. Well, greetings. Welcome to the Business of Agriculture. It's me, Damian Mason. You already knew that because it said so in the introduction. Got a great presentation. I'm sorry, a program for you today. The program is going to be what's up with wheat and why is there no GMO wheat? Um, if you pay attention to the news, if you pay attention to my podcast, you probably see we've got shortness of inventory. There's record prices being paid for wheat right now. China's hoarding wheat, we're told. Uh, we know the Russia-Ukraine situation there. They can't get it out or Russia's stealing it. It's a damn mess. But also, wheat is one of those things that you can grow just about anywhere. I think every continent, every part of the continent uh, over the country, you know, grows wheat in some capacity. But we ain't got enough of it. And one reason might be that we're not scientifically doing all that we can to raise more wheat. Terry Wanzik is one of my guests, and Darren Padgett is my other guest. They're both farmers. Terry is a farmer in North Dakota. Darren is a farmer in Oregon. I was reading this week while I was traveling the Wall Street Journal, and there's an article that says, A Solution to the Wheat Shortage, Genetically Modified Crops. This was penned by Mr. Terry Wanzik, who is a North Dakota state senator, in addition to being a farmer. And I said, I'm going to get him on here. So we're going to talk about the world of wheat, what the heck's going on with wheat, but more importantly, why there's no genetically engineered seed for wheat. Terry, thanks for being here. Yep. You're welcome. Glad to be a guest. And, and I'm the only person that's contacted you after reading this article, or did you do your phone ringing off the hook? Well, no, I've had a lot of uh, emails and uh, texts and, and, you know, people commenting, but mostly all positive from uh, some university professors and, and researchers and other farmers. I also uh, want to say that Darren is a, uh, not just a wheat producer in uh, Oregon's high country. He also is a past chairman of the U.S. Wheat Associates, which means he went all over the globe traveling, promoting wheat. So, Darren, welcome to being – welcome to, and thanks for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let's go right to this. A solution to the wheat shortage, genetically modified crops. I know you've got your opinions about that, so we're going to hear from you. But let's, in a nutshell, before we get into the whole GMO, why there is or is not GMO wheat in the in the in the in the countryside, what the hell is going on with wheat? You're the guy that travels a country, travels the world, or, or did until a week ago when you uh, got replaced. What's going on with wheat? Well, it's in short supply. <laughs> and this is unusual uh, because, in general, we deal with surpluses, and it's not been the case this year. Well, there for a few years, the world was in a greenhouse, as Vince Peterson, who's the CEO, said. And ample supplies, the wheat was flowing, wasn't a problem. But the last year or two, now we've hit drought. Australia's taken their turn. The U.S. has taken different parts, has, has taken their turn this year. Of course, that last year spilled into Canada as well who are your major exporters. Uh, there's 30, Russia, Ukraine together, collectively, there's about 13, 14% of the world's world, uh, wheat production, but they're 30% of the exports. And the U.S. is about half that. So even if we wanted to, we couldn't even begin to backfill that if we double production. They are 13% of global production, but yeah. they send more of their stuff away. So they account for- What is the percentage of- Global trade. They, they present. They they, they, make up, they they make up one third of all traded wheat. Close to it, yeah. Okay. And a lot of that is uh, goes to price buyers. So you know your African nations, Middle East. It's freight logical. 
Uh, most people are just trying to keep bellies from chewing, you know, belly buttons from chewing on a backbone. Yeah. And that's where a lot of that grain grows. With this war going on, this is where you're going to see, I would assume, riots and different things from lack of food. It's already I've understood in Sri Lanka starting. But that black sea wheat is not making it to those destinations. And people go, well, why doesn't the U.S. just backfill? The Secretary of Agriculture said we could do it. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. And uh, even if we could, there are shipping logistics and a lot of other stuff that goes into that that is just pretty much impossible. And even if we raised more and doubled yields, I don't know if we could get it to the right people that need it. And when you do donations and different things like that, especially monetary, there's so much corruption yeah. and different things, you know, the people don't always get it that need it. There's a lot, yeah. of, there's there's a lot of people don't realize that, Darren, that all this whole, you know, the United Nations, I say, is an activist group, frankly. Um, they, they, I'm not sure they even care that, that the good is done. They care that they stay funded. Um, we've been shipping grain on behalf of the United Nations for decades. And then you find out that actually this warring tribe took control of all of it. And then just yep. the warlords sold it and pocketed the money. And so you still got the people starving. That still happens, right? Yep. And we want to... Uh... And then when the U.S. ships, we're on volume, so we want to ship, you know, usually the smallest anymore is about 750,000 bushels, usually a million to two million, which is a Panamax. So we want to go big or go home. Well, a lot of these ports have to take a smaller ship. So there's the first problem. The second thing, literally a lot of it gets put in a sack and hauled in on a donkey. People don't realize how much of the world still eats with their fingers. Mm -hmm. there's just a lot that goes on to it. And as you just alluded to the warlords and everything, a lot of times when you get this kind of stuff going on, they profit from it and the people that need it go without. Yeah. Um, by the way, you said that the USA is about half of half of as much as the Russia, Ukraine in terms of exports. So we are an export. We are an export country on wheat and we amount, we amount to how much usually on exported wheat? 50% uh, of the crop gets exported and that's about roughly uh 900 million to a billion bushels, depending on the year. And that would be been maybe, down here because the price has been high and we simply didn't have it. If we send, we send half of what we produce overseas here in the U S and then is that amount to maybe 10% of global trade wheat? 15, 15% of globally traded wheat. Okay. Terry Wanzik, uh, before, we yes. talk about, before we talk about your article, you're a North Dakota guy. I started going to North Dakota for my speaking business in 1995, landed in Bismarck. Um, I thought this is an interesting country. And then I've been there a bunch of times since you were a big wheat state. I don't think you were the biggest wheat state. I think it used to be Kansas. And then of course you got the Washington's and you got the Oregon's where Aaron is and all that. But North Dakota grew a lot of wheat also because it was cold up there. You planted wheat because you couldn't grow corn or soybeans up there. Some of that has changed because of genetics, but also because of economics. You're a farmer. You don't hardly grow wheat anymore, Right. 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 And there are many neighbors who don't grow wheat at all anymore. OK, so take me through the history on that. Well, um, you know, I, I probably the best way is to uh, list the data from USDA National Egg Statistical Service. Um, when you look up our county back in 1996, there was 450,000 acres of wheat growing in our county and only about 2,600 acres of soybeans and 18,000 acres of corn. Mm -hmm. Now you go to today, soybeans, the last few years, we've averaged around 460,000 acres of soybeans, um, 200,000 acres of corn, and wheat's down to around 80,000 acres. Okay. So, so just to give you an idea of the, the kind of shift in production. And when I grew up, my, my grandfather, my great grandfather, my dad, they grew mostly wheat, wheat, barley and oats or cereal grains. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of result in that. I use 96 because that's kind of the year when some of this new technology started coming out in soybeans and corn. Yeah. Yeah. 1996, uh, the, the anti-GMO crowd uh, doesn't the anti-GMO crowd doesn't think much about 1996, but certainly I do. Because if you had to walk soybean fields as a kid to get rid of volunteer corn and weeds because the weed control was so terrible, I always told everybody, 
if you're anti-GMO, come out here on a 95 degree day. I'll put start at one county road and I'll give you a weed hook. And by the time you get to the other end of that field to the other county road, you're going to love genetically engineered soybeans that are Roundup tolerant because you don't have to do all that crap. Um, the Atlantic Magazine in uh, May or April uh, had an article that said, Ethanol is starving people. We don't grow wheat in the United States anymore because ethanol makes corn valuable. And all of you evil, greedy farmers, and I'm talking about you two in particular, said, screw it. I'm not going to grow wheat anymore. I'm just going to grow corn because I want people to starve because I'd rather sell my corn to an ethanol plant. Is that true, Terry Wanzik? I would say not. Uh, you know, they they probably don't realize a lot of uh the byproduct of uh, producing ethanol is DDGs, dried distiller grains, which are still used to feed li to livestock yeah. of many different kinds, and it's used to generate food. Um, in my opinion, uh, you could say ethanol, we're getting, you know, two for the price of one. I mean, we, we still use that, that, that product for food production. Yeah, well, uh, the Atlantic isn't known as an agriculturally oriented magazine. You grow less wheat now as because of the economics, period, right? You can make more money growing other stuff than you can growing wheat. The economics and, and you know, the tools that allow the, the technology that has allowed us to be uh, more efficient, more productive, and also the improved genetics for northern growing areas. I mean, we're, we're grow, we grow 85 to 90 day corn, yeah. but we're, 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 you know, when I was growing up, we pretty much only raised corn for silage to chop for silage. And uh, and to the know, listener, to the listener that's right now saying, "Wait a minute, I work in ag, but I'm in food processing. What's that mean?" Real quickly, you're talking about shorter season corn that's available now and can still get you yield because in the old days, explain that. Well, in the old days, you know, our growing season of course is a lot shorter than Iowa or Illinois, um, or even southeastern North Dakota. Um, I'm in South Central area, and I mean, there's corn growing all the way up to the Canadian border now. Uh, you can get as as early of, as a 78 day corn, and those early varieties, the genetics have improved immensely. I mean, you're going to give up some yield, but um, we're raising 85 day corn that that you know can yield 180 to 200 bushels. Yeah, and, and you're our farm, and we would have never ever dreamt that we could get those kind of yields when I was growing up. So, and the reason I wanted you to explain that, so somebody that doesn't know that you said you raised corn only for silage, to make silage, it doesn't have to dry down. To make dry right. corn that you actually shell has to dry down. And in a North Dakota growing season and genetics that we had 40 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, so you're growing corn because it makes more economic sense, period. I'm sorry, repeat You're the growing question. corn because it makes you more money. Right. It's an economic thing. Um, definitely, we're making more money growing corn and soybeans than we do normally growing wheat. This year, of course, wheat prices are are up as well, and but still, uh, soybeans and corn prices are right up there as well. So it's still not going to encourage us to grow a whole lot of more wheat. Darren, when I was in Morrow, Oregon, one of the times I've been there, you and I sat down uh, and, and talked and you told me, and I think we even put it on a podcast, you said, I got three choices to make my, my farm productive out here. Um, wheat, wheat, and wheat. <laughs> so you can't grow corn in Morrow, Oregon, and you can't grow soybeans. So is it true that the corn and soybean, the genetics and the science has made it, and it's more profitable, that we're going to starve people. Are we in this wheat conundrum because of greed and because of ethanol? You can't grow corn. So anyway, it don't matter. So you can give me an unbiased answer. No. And there's a big reason why the world shifted to corn, if I might add. And the reason I can grow wheat in a 10-inch rainfall area is because there's six times the DNA makeup in a plant of wheat than there is a human body. So it's very, when you're a bottom feeder like myself, that's what you grow. But back. And, and when, we're, 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 he's joking, of course, dear listener. He's saying bottom feeder, meaning he farms in some rough, uh, rough climatological slash um, uh, geographical areas. Is that the way we're looking at it? Yeah, that's just my term to make it more 
make you think a little bit. 10, 10, but, 10, 10 inches of annual precipitation on fields that I've pointed out. If they were in Huntington, Indiana, they'd put a chairlift on them because he's got some of those fields <laughs> where you have to have the, the combine with the hydraulics to level it off and all that. So you can grow wheat there. But they're not growing wheat where they can where they can grow something well, else, whereas you can't. So that does mean that we have less supply, right? To a certain point, yes. And and when we had the Freedom to Farm Act go through, that's when people got to start growing whatever they wanted. And as Terry said, the genetics increased. And when George Bush was in there, we had a lot of extra crop. And now we're putting 40% of the of the corn crop to the gas tank, which was politically palatable. And I told a lot of people, if we weren't doing that. You hadn't seen a bloodletting going on when you've got 13, 14 billion bushels of corn and 40 percent of it doesn't have a, a home as it does now. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit tax code driven mm -hmm. and it elevated everything else. And then you put the genetics with it and guys like Terry now can can go corn and they should if it makes more sense. I've asked a lot of people said, well, GMO wheat. You know, that sure helped the yield and everything. I said, so how much more four or five dollar wheat do you want to have on the market? <laughs> yeah, of course, we don't have $4 wheat now, and we're going to get to the GMO stuff. Uh, we're going to take a quick little uh, second here and remind our listeners that if you enjoy the Business of Agriculture podcast and you like to see what's happening on some of America's most progressive, success-minded farms, check out what I'm doing, the good work at Extreme Ag. Extreme Ag, there's no E on the front of that, just extremeag.farm is the website. We've recorded hundreds of podcasts, over 100 podcasts, videos on farm, uh, trials that we're doing with new products, new products practices, articles from successful farming there on LinkedIn. So dear listener, if you like what's happening in agriculture and you want to see something, some things that are happening at the farm level, check out the work we're doing at extremeag.farm and it doesn't cost you nothing. You can just go there and check it all out. Uh, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Okay. Uh, before we get to the GMO thing, you just said something really smart there that, all right, the tax code drove us to, uh, and, and the renewable fuel standards created the whole thing for ethanol. And I've recorded uh, for our listeners, uh, the, the chief uh, executive officer of the Renewable Fuels Association has been on this. Um, his name is Jeff Cooper. He's been on here twice. So go back and look at that. But the point is, yeah, we took 40 percent, 38, I think is the real number of, of, of um, the corn crop goes to ethanol. But as Terry said, it doesn't all go there and just sit. It comes back with byproducts, but et cetera. We're using a lot of corn through ethanol. If we didn't have that, there'd be a bunch more corn sitting around. And then maybe it'd be cheap enough that some people would say, heck, I'm going to grow some wheat. So there is some reality to this. But have we really been producing markedly less wheat in terms of the bushels per acre as we did 20, 30 years ago? I didn't think that the wheat volume had changed that much in terms of bushels. Am I wrong? Yeah, the yields have come up over the years. Even though it's not GMO, there's been a steady increase in, in yields. You know, when I was growing up, if you got a 30 bushel crop, you know, it was a big deal. Now, you know, 40 is more of an average. And this year, we're going to cut 50 to 60 in a PNW on, on ground like mine. So that gives you an, an idea of what the genetics and the breeding has done to it. Yeah. But, so, uh, you, are, you know, they're still, they're still putting out, you know, 1.8, 1.9 billion bushels a week. And there's been plenty around until now. So 1.9 billion bushels is the U.S. production. And if we looked back 25 years ago, it would probably be about that same number, wouldn't it? I'd have to go look it up, Damien. I, I don't, I just can't give you that information. But the point Probably is, general, maybe more, I don't know. Yeah, but in general, we haven't very, we haven't decreased our wheat production by half or anything like no, that. No, no, we've increased bushels per acre. Yeah. But we haven't really decreased the production that much. No. So um, what's the deal with uh, the global supply? Um, we really are going to have people starving. It is about the war and it is about disruption in, in uh, supply chains and a complete distortion of markets. Um, Terry, what's the word? Uh, is there is there a bunch of wheat being stockpiled in China and then Russia's stockpiled also? They want to have more unrest. What's the story? You know, I, 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 I couldn't answer that question. I'm not an expert in that area. And that's probably where... Um, yeah, I, sorry, I forgot your name. Darren. Darren. That's probably where Darren would have much more knowledge about that. But I've read, I've, I've read uh, from a farmer in the Ukraine saying that a lot of the wheat, there's been wheat stolen from, by Russia from some of the Ukrainian farmers, and, and they're stockpiling and hoarding. They're not shipping. Russia's not shipping it. 
I don't know what the reason would be. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just don't know why that, why that's happening. Darren, why is it, why is it just, well, power? is it just power that this country wants to hold on to their stuff? Cause the more, more they hold, the more power they have. First off, nobody really knows what China has. You never do. They say they have this, you have to take it at face value. They claim they have half of the world's reserves, but last year they were a big buyer. This year, not so much so far. Uh, we'll see with new crop. But uh, in the Ukraine situation, they could export maybe out through Poland by rail, but their gauges on their railroads, railroads do not line up. So there's a big logistical issue of trying to go that route. Uh, Odessa used to be their big uh, export uh, facility. I'm not sure, and nobody really knows exactly what's going on there. Plus, they put mines out there. So if somebody did want to go in and get it, yeah. uh, you need somebody there uh, cl clearing the way to make sure that something doesn't blow up. So yeah, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, you're, otherwise your ship's going to get blown up. Yeah. And with the price of freight right now, you know, you want that ship on top of the water and not underneath it. Um. The, the issue then about our production, and this is kind of how I end up having this whole thing come together. So I'm reading this article in the Wall Street Journal, a solution to the wheat shortage, genetically modified crops. It's written by Terry Wanzik. I called him up and then I said, I got to have Darren on here because he'll give me some global perspective on it also. GMO soybeans, 1996. Genetically engineered corn, I don't know, somewhere in the early 2000s, if my memory serves me correctly. Papayas, sugar beets, uh, even now potatoes, if I'm not mistaken, all using genetically engineered uh, seed traits where we engineer traits into the GM, into the seed to make it work. There was so much misinformation about GMOs. This hit its peak, I'd say about 2014. Everybody decided, their sister decided they were opposed to GMOs. They didn't know what the hell they were, but they're opposed to them. <laughs> it's kind of moved away. It's completely accepted now, or it's not completely accepted, but food radicals, whole food petition signers, they care about it. But the general public says, what, $6 gas? I can't afford to eat. I don't give a damn. Feed it to me. Why is there still no GMO wheat, Terry? Well, I think I think with people like Darren at work with the U.S. Wheat Associates, there's always been a concern, which was a valid concern about the marketplace and whether they would accept that. But as 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 you said, you know, you look at how long we've uh, been using uh, GMO soybeans and corn, and and how readily acceptable they are, and and it's even created a niche market within soybeans in the sense some people want non-GMO soybeans. Well, it gave producers an opportunity to get a premium for growing non-GMO soybeans, and I always felt that well, if if somebody really wants non-GMO wheat, uh, us farmers have have system of bins and, and production tools that we could grow a, a non-GMO crop for a non-GMO market. We'll give, we'll give the market what it wants, but it's pretty hard to do that when you're not even allowed to ever uh, use them. And one thing, one thing where I see GMO could really help with our wheat production, another problem I, we have with wheat is the uncertainty. You know, we, we can, we can forward contract uh, soybeans and corn, and especially with the kind of product production of capabilities we have now. And we don't have to worry about all the other issues like with wheat. Uh, we have a real problem in our area with Donner, vomitoxin, fusarium head blight. Um, you know, if, you're, if your vom levels a certain level, you think you have nice looking wheat, you haul it up the elevator and they tell you it's worth half of what, what the market is or ergot, you have ergot problems. Uh, I could see this technology helping provide some natural resistance to, to those kinds of diseases and help create a little more certainty in marketing your wheat uh, ahead, of, ahead of what you know you have. And you can't take advantage of these high prices because you, you might have low protein, you might have falling numbers problems, you might have VOM problems, you might have ergot problems. There's so many more problems in trying to market wheat. Um, first off, I think you said a lot, uh, and that's good. Um, first off, when people 
in ag, when people outside of ag, my neighbors in the suburbs of Arizona, where I live half the year, if I say GMO, ah, Dr. Oz said it was evil or whatever, they don't even know. And they, they, they many of them think GMO is a pesticide you spray on them. I once saw like Dr. Oz telling his audience that these factory farms spray these GMOs on their crops. I'm like, that's like saying spray, we spray tonsillectomies. It's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a technology. It's not a product, right? You know, ge- genetically engineered means it's a process. It's a technology, well, so, it's not a t- herbicide. It's a anyway. technical process of, uh, you know, genetically, I mean, in, in a sense, didn't the Indians or the Native Americans originally take maize and, uh, and create corn by crossing them two different plants? I mean, it's, it's about, you know, uh, addressing, identifying genetic traits that are beneficial and, and breeding them into the plant. So, um, yeah, exactly. And I don't know for sure about the Native Americans. I wasn't here, but um, I would say this. We've done a hell of a good job with genetically engineering stuff. And when you say, if you're even around people that are somewhat literate about this, they equate genetically engineered or GMO with glyphosate tolerant. And as Terry pointed out, no, what if we did Roundup? Didn't worry about glyphosate and Roundup. What if instead we did genetically engineered to be resistant to fusarium, whatever that word is, and all these blights? Darren, would that not work? Well, the first thing is to get real customer acceptance. You know, everybody has an iPhone or whatever. Yeah. That, that's the key. And there's some differences in there. Let's back up just a little bit on the breeding because I think GMOs would be a great thing, especially for somebody in a drought area. That's what BioSeries re- released in Argentina is a GMO wheat that has drought tolerance to it. And for somebody who it normally doesn't rain between May and October, mm-hmm. that sounds pretty pretty attractive. But let's talk about how we got here. First off, when you breed wheat, it used to be it took eight to 10 years to get a finished product to where a terrier I can plant it. Now that number is more like six or seven years. But I, my wife is from Portland, so I talk to a lot of urban people. So I've come up with some stupid analogies that seem to work. First off, when, a wheat, when wheat is crossed, it's crossed six to 8,000 times before we get that finished product. And I liken it to crashing two cars together and you rebuild a car out of the parts and pieces. Maybe you got the tires you want, the windshield, but you didn't get the radio. Do it again, you got the radio, but the bumper's wrong. And you do it and you do it and you do it. And pretty soon, yeah, that's what we got to go with. Not perfect, but it's as close as it's going to get. So with GM, all you go in and you'll, you surgically take the bumper off that car and you swap it with the other one and you got what you need. So that's the advantage. And the time frame to bring it to fruition would be much better. Yeah, but, we, did, we, did, we just saved, we just saved 6,000 crashes and we, and, and a few years, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, very, very surgical, very precise. Uh, you know, there were kids going blind in Africa because of lack of vitamin A. They put vitamin A in their rice, and guess what? They're not going blind. Right. And, and it's all done through genetic engineering of, of a seed trait. So there's still resistance against this, and it's out of – is it out of ignorance and fear? Uh, a lot of it and and plenty, having plenty. When I always said until you can go to the grocery store and, and uh, get it off the shelf or flip the switch and your light didn't come on, people didn't give a rip. Well, we've seen toilet paper absence. We've seen flour gone. And you're right. The high elevation of price, I think, would be more acceptable now than before. But the difference, and I was in Japan one time and dining with the Nishin people. Nishin is 40% of Japan's milling capacity. Of the exports, they roughly buy 5% of the U.S. wheat crop to that one mill when you boil down the numbers. 5% 5% of the U.S. wheat crop goes to one mill in Japan. Mission, mission milling company. I mean, that's a lot of mills, but they, yeah. they they swing a pretty big stick, even though Japan's number three and four now on our, uh, usually about number three on the export customers. It used to be number one, but they have a stagnant population. So they're not buying as much as the very quality buyers. And they're the ones when you had the GMO outbreak in 2013 that led to charge. And whatever Japan does, the rest of North Asia does. South Asia, not so uh, concerned about it. And I said, so what's the difference? You got soybeans, you got corn. Well, that goes through an animal before it goes into you. Wheat goes directly in the mouth. <laughs> and Japanese consumer 
and the U.S. consumer to that effect says, we don't want it. So let's go produce a product that they don't want and try to sell it to them. Uh Now, if you really want to do it, and here's one of those goofy analogies, but Damien, you're going to laugh. If you wanted to sell, everybody has to be a winner. The farmer, the handler, and the customer. So therefore, we need Viagra wheat. (laughs) First, it's blues. I would be for that. Start to finish, right? Then the end user, well, that's a given what's going to happen. And for the farmer, no lodging. Win, win, win. I now, like that's it. a simple, oversimplified version, but that's what it's going to take. They simply, the customer is not there. And you got non-GMO, GMO. If you're doing that at two systems, you got to be able to test it at the elevator. And there may be a premium for non-GMO wheat. But in the PNW, we're especially sensitive to it because 85 to 90% of our crop goes out the door. We're in the Midwest. It's much less in its domestic supply, but Mexico takes a huge part out of the Midwest. Yeah. They're our number one buyer, not wanting GMO at this point. So by the way, real quickly, uh, Darren keeps saying the PNW, that means Pacific Northwest where there's a lot of wheat growing out there. And uh, then when he's talking about the percentages of crops, I'm sitting here in Indiana. We don't move the wheat market. We barely grow wheat. We grow wheat around here, maybe because it's $12 a bushel or because you're going to put drainage tile in and you want to do that in July. We grew wheat growing up because I was a dairy farm kid and we needed to straw and we needed a place to put manure starting about the second week of July. But the point is he's in, where Darren is, most of that wheat gets put on uh, container ships and goes to Asia because he's in the Pacific Northwest. And those customers, as he said, Japan swings a big bat and so Japan's a wealthier country that also is very dependent on food imports. And when they say, here's the kind of food we want, then we we do that because we're, we're a cash buyer, not a credit buyer, too. So that means we're going to pay. We're going to cook, cook what the cook, what the customer orders. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm going to dovetail into that real quick, Damien. I've also had visitors on the farm from the Philippines, Bangkok, you know, South Asia. And one day they're inspecting my fields for seed. And they go, and yes, and this, and this, this, no GMO. And they go, I don't care. But North Asia cares. So you've got that dynamic there. And the yeah. U.S. Consumers. Now, a couple of things. First off, there's going to be somebody that's going to say, well, wait a minute. You keep talking about genetically engineering this wheat. What's that going to accomplish? Well, I think we just said, if not even worried about the glyphosate tolerance, let's just stay away from that one because, you know, the world wants to sue Bayer over Roundup lawsuits. Don't even worry about that. But genetically engineer in there, the resistance to the blights and the funguses and the things that are prone to happening in wheat. Those are pretty much it, right, Terry? That's right. You know, uh, I've never actually been a big supporter of glyphosate resistant wheat i don't think that's as important to me as a producer either you know uh it's it's those other uh, issues that could maybe be addressed through through uh genetic uh you know uh, mod- modification that that make me that gets me interested in, in the process and i understand that you know, even when I wrote that article, I mean, I, I that that's not going to solve all our wheat problems, but it was brought up as one of the reasons in our part of the country why, uh, you know, you saw the shift in acres. I mean, we went from 2,600 soybeans uh, 25 years ago to um, yeah, 400,000. 400, 400, so here's so, my question. Then, what, what do you think? What do you think? I want both of you. What do you think the average yield boosts by if we have genetically engineered wheat in the United States? Do we get 20% more per acre just because we can figure out a way to genetically engineer away from the the blights and the funguses and the rusts and things like this? Well, again, I base mine on my personal experience. Uh, I, I, you know, we grew, we grew soybeans 25 years ago. And if we got better than a 20 bushel yield, we were pretty excited. And now we're, you know, we have individual fields that run 65 bushels, 70 bushels, you know, um, averaging 45, 50 on on all our acres. Um, So we three three times in, in, in less than 30 years, we three times or even three and a half times our soybean output. And you can say, well, that some of that would have happened even without genetically engineered traits, maybe just because of some better in genetics and some better herbicides. But either way, still three and a half times. Is it possible to do that with wheat, Darren, with through genetic engineering? 
Well, you never know until you start doing it. But right now, the, the variety that BioSeries put out in Argentina, it's like a 10% boost in yield, but it's a drought gene. Where Terry's at, they have much more disease pressure. So that's where their concern is. And, uh, you know, with, with Dawn and vomitoxin and all that kind of stuff, getting it into people's bellies and not into the feedlot is a big deal. Um, on the other hand, I'm glad they can't raise as much wheat because that makes a better price for those of us that that's all we can grow. And they're raising what works economically for them. And I'm raising what works economically for me. It's funny how water seeks its own level. <laughs> so so it, it, it is a reality that um, if if we are able to double our wheat production in the next five years, uh, we're going to we'll have all the supply we need. And then obviously the price adjusts downward, which means you're 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 hauling more bushels off of your Sherman County, uh, Oregon farm. But you're also getting less for bushels. So then you're working harder and making the same amount of money. No, well, there's one other factor in there. Terry, what's a sack of seed corn cost? Um, we probably spend close to 90 to 100 bucks an acre for seed, for corn. On, on corn. Yeah, I was going to say about yeah. 300 about $325 a bag, I think, is what I'm hearing. From. Well, ours it depends on which which varieties you pick and that and, you know, whether they're BT or, or non-BT. Uh, um, but we, we're anywhere from uh, 200 to 295 bucks a bag, you know, and that's with our discounts and yeah. uh, volume. Okay. Discounts. So, so I know where Darren's going with this and a bag of seed corn yeah. for the listener that doesn't know anything about it produces, you it will, will plant about 2.4 acres roughly. Is that what I'm looking at? About two and a half acres we yeah. figure in our area. Yeah. Okay. So a bag of seed corn for 300 bucks, let's call it plants two and a half acres bag of wheat seed wheat costs, Darren. With, with treat. Uh, now, right now with the high prices, probably eighteen, nineteen dollars, and that's, and that seed, and that's treated a little seed. over a bushel. That's treated seed, and, cover, and how much? And with, and with a royalty, because yeah. a lot of us got privates in there now. How much? I'm saying this the price could go up. I mean, if we start having to pay fifty dollars a bushel, we'll plant it if it makes. You know, if you get the return on investment, Terry wouldn't be planting what he's did if he didn't get the return. But you got to be careful what you wish for. One other. Wait a minute. How many apples. acres? How many just to do apples to apples? How many acres uh, does your eighteen dollar bag of seed wheat? Plant? Uh, where I'm at, that'll do about eight tenths of an acre. Okay, so on an acre cost basis, you're still uh, he's he's over there at about a hundred dollars an acre on seed, and you're at about twenty five or something. No, well, no, it'd be more like fourteen. Okay. The 15. Um, but one thing that is accepted, and I actually sat there with, with Nish and Milling one night having dinner, because that's what you do. And uh, they uh, they looked at me, and normally years ago I would have just blurted something out, but I had enough sense to think about it for a minute after multiple beers and glasses of sake. <laughs> <laughs> they said, so what do you think about CRISPR technology, which I assume you're familiar with? Yep. gene editing and i thought about it for a second and took a drink of beer and said well what do you think about crispr technology <sighs> and they're growing two thumbs up so that's a big deal and i think that's an easier sell at this point is to use the gene editing and go in and sh shut that right now we're, we're battling with rust which is very rare but it does happen go and shut that gene off that you know makes it susceptible to rust or whatever I don't know how it works with Don or Vomitox and Terry, if they could, you know, if there's a, a gene in there somewhere they could switch off, but that is politically palatable at this point. So it may be a baby step thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would agree. I would agree with you, Darren. So isn't it interesting that CRISPR is just kind of like, um, uh, it, it's more acceptable, but it still is doing genetically engineering uh, stuff. It's kind of like MySpace, that wasn't cool, but Facebook is cool. So CRISPR is just the <laughs> Facebook to, to GEMOs MySpace. Is that what we're doing here? Yeah. A lot of people just want to, you know, they want to feel good about what they're doing. Look, food is such a personal, emotional thing. Yeah. You know, you go on the first date, what do you do? Dinner and a movie. You get together for your family, you know, and you've got the big Thanksgiving dinner. You know, it, it's just, it's the most personal 
close to you kind of thing there is, and, and people do care about it, unless it's way expensive, and then, well, maybe not so much, if I can say. Hey, uh, Terry, since I've been, I haven't been to your town exactly, but I've been close, and I can tell you, I've been to Sherman County, Oregon, a number of times. When he says dinner and a movie for a date, he means you can go to, there's one tavern in the county, and as far as the movie, <laughs> somebody that you know might have an old VHS player and some old VHS <laughs> tapes there. They had a theater, they had a theater for 40 miles from where he lives. So it's good. Uh, well, actually, the community I live in is about fifteen, sixteen thousand. It's a, it's got a more than one restaurant anyway, and probably has a movie theater also. Yeah, we have a cinema movie yeah. theater. Hey, so um, what did we not cover? We talked about the global wheat situation. Is there going to be pressure now? Is there going to be pressure now to say, you know what, things are bad? Let's go ahead and push this genetically engineered seed out there because we got people starving in Africa. There's going to be food riots, as Darren pointed out, like there was in 2014 with the whole Arab Spring thing. That was mostly a food shortage uh, induced violence, not to mention they've got some other political issues over there. Are we going to see enough pressure that are like, screw it, genetically engineered stuff? Is this what is it going to happen because of the necessities of mother invention? Uh, Terry, you go first. Well, boy, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, uh, stop being a politician I, and answer yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that could possibly. I, I think it could uh, present a situation. I think there has to be some uh, desperation at some point that could push us in that direction. You know, uh, the, the necessity uh, of having those uh, bushels, if if it does help solve that problem, I think it could. It could be pressured in. It could be more acceptable. Darren, is there going to be? But I, I, I deal with some of the same relatives and that that come from the city, and and I, I know what uh, Darren's talking about. I mean, there's a lot of ignorance, and I and I go on Facebook, and you know, being a public official, I try to not comment too much on there, but there's times you can just see the ignorance and and some of these issues uh, being addressed, like on Facebook or. Twitter or whatever. Is it going to happen, Darren? Because um, we know that the the Portland social media mom that uh, marches against Monsanto is going to be dead set against it. And as Terry pointed out, there still can be a market for her. I got a friend right here in my county that's an organic farmer, not because he's a zealot, but because it made sense for him for business. He's selling $39 bushel soybeans uh, organic ones, obviously that's, that's a hell of a lot better than record prices that were or $16 for conventional. There's a market for the non-GMO, but is the necessity of the person that's not the March against Monsanto Portland, uh, woman, uh, that decides that, uh, you know, you know, is there the other customer, the poor woman is trying to buy food for her family that right now is paying $5 for gas and, and seeing no, you know, shortages for crying out loud. Is that person going to finally say we got to push this and it gets pushed through? I don't think they're to that point yet. And especially, you know, customer acceptance, there's, there's a couple of things. If you had uh, some trait, you know, took all the wrinkles out of your forehead or something like that, that they had to have, it'd be like the phone be drawn through the system. Wally Curtis taught me that's the best way to, when it's drawn through the system, you can't beat it. If you're up there trying to ram it through, yeah. you're usually doomed to fail. The one thing that's interesting that I wonder because the genie's out of the bottle now with BioSeries, you know, Brazil had to accept that and they'll accept it in flour, but I'm not sure if they'll accept it in, in raw product, that GMO wheat. And I can't believe there isn't going to be some escapes to other parts of the world. Um, that it just, it's happening. Uh, you know, Monsanto, or excuse me, I guess it's, oh, let's see, Bayer, Bayer uh, but it's Westbred. Is there, Westbred. they've got material there. It's all, tucked away they didn't get rid of it back in in 2003 or 4 but that was the attitude is well let's just do it and they'll have to deal with it not real good business sense there's a reason why bill gates and and all of elon and all those people are where they are they didn't you know they got something that the product that was that they wanted to be drawn through the system and, and that's the the catch-22 yeah the, um, the product needs find, to be the product needs to be demanded you're saying the product needs to be demanded and yeah. and desired versus jam down the throats. And I, I'd say that's accurate. And that's where there's been a shitload of PR problems for Monsanto and Bayer on that whole front. 
I always tell my urban people when I'm talking to that gal with the stringy gray hair down to her shoulder that's in her mid-60s, she goes, well, I hope you don't seed Monsanto seeds. And I said, I don't. But if you're anti-Monsanto, you're pro-soil erosion. <laughs> and that makes them stop. I said, you know what Roundup is? Oh, yes, my God, it's this and that. And I said, well, there's not been one thing that saved more billions of tons of topsoil in this country as Roundup has. How much more dirt would you like than water? I can get out my bottom plow and beat the hell out of the ground and it could wash down the creek. It's by golly, you'll have non-GMO product mm -hmm. or Roundup free. And they usually go off talking to themselves and I don't know what happens after. Uh, yeah, right. They don't. They don't. They don't fully understand that. You, no. you could also say that it it's also beneficial to wildlife. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with with uh, more residue left in minimum till and no till, mm -hmm. uh, you see a lot of uh, waterfall or you know other animals, deer, and that in those fields in the fall yep. because they're not black. <laughs> you yeah. know, there, there's food. There's food there to eat. Yeah, you mean yeah. that they're not plowed up like they used to be? They're not plowed yeah. up like they used to be, yeah. So um, I think that they're going to be a push for this, and it's because the movement against GMOs, I think it hit its zenith between about the years 2014 and 2016, and I see it, I've seen it waning from my perspective as a label reader and a food sort of uh, observer. But I don't know that. And are you going to buy and plant genetically engineered See, the worst thing that happens is the rest of the world allows it and you and you're not allowed to have it. Right. That's the worst case scenario. The rest of the world has it. We'll have it. Right. That's what I'm saying. The, wor the worst case scenario is everybody else has it but you and then you're at a competitive disadvantage. Well, it depends on if I'm like your neighbor selling thirty nine dollar wheat. Yeah. <laughs> Soybeans. Yes. But yes. Right. You'd sell thirty nine bushel, thirty nine dollar bushel of wheat, wouldn't you? Oh, I, I imagine a, a couple. Yeah. I go out <laughs> water it by hand. <laughs> I, ironically, well, that story, right? Ironically, the wheat we grow is mostly for seed production. We work through AgriPro wheats uh, under Syngenta, so a lot of the wheat we personally grow is for seed propagation. Uh, by the way, are your people? This is the last thing. Are your people telling you that this is coming, and it's just a matter of when? Are they telling you no because uh, we've been we've been anti-GMO wheat for so long? What's your Syngenta people tell you? Oh, uh, you know, I my son has kind of taken over that. I, you know, I don't talk to him as much, so I haven't I haven't gone to some of the um, meetings and stuff like that. I'd have hmm. to have him come and I'll ask him. I'll ask that. Him. Darren, what are your people telling you? You're involved with people higher up. Are they saying, yeah, this is, this is going to be, we're going to have genetically engineered traits in three years? Not without customer uh, approval. Buy-in? Okay. Yeah, you got to have it. I mean, half the crop and domestically, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'd like it to happen, but it's going to take a little bit. You got to have a home for it. And the Russian-Ukraine thing isn't going to happen forever. If anywhere it was going to happen first, would have been, I would guess, China, mm -hmm. because nobody knows what goes on there. They got a lot of mouths to feed. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's going to work the system, they would. So but that's we'll the bellwether. The bellwether is but they're also said, GMO, they say. What's that? They say they're anti GMO and weak, but I doubt that. Okay. So if they get to where they're <laughs> wide open, if they get to be there wide open on genetic, if China says we're genetic, we're all free for genetic engineered wheat, then all of a sudden that's the first domino that falls. Japan needs to be the first one that falls. Japan. Okay. All right. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, go and check out the other 240 some odd episodes. Been doing this for five years here at the Business of Agriculture. Uh, share it with your friends, farming and non-farming alike. A lot of tremendous information because I got great guests. People like Darren Padgett, my buddy from Sherman County, Oregon. And now you're going to go look that up. You're going to say, wait a minute. He keeps talking about Morrow, Oregon. Is this really a place? Yes, it is. You go east of Portland, 100 miles, then turn south 20 miles. And if you think Oregon looks like what you've seen the pictures of Portland, that ain't what it looks like in Morrow, Oregon, because it's high and dry and curvy and hilly and the good news is uh darren and has, has taken me to the two different taverns that sherman county sports which uh, i gotta tell you it's it's a fun place to go and have have cold banquet beers uh terry wanzik speaking of such things the next time i'm in your neighborhood in north dakota i'm gonna look you up if you can be seen in public with somebody that's not a, a highfalutin politician like yourself he's a state senator you can look up that article in the wall street journal just type in the search engine wall street journal uh terry wanzik that's w-a-n-z-e-k and you can read 
read the article he wrote, calling it a solution to the wheat shortage, genetically modified crops. Thanks for being here, both of you. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, so nice to meet you, Darren. Nice to meet you. Keep, good to have them both here. All right. Until next time, it's the business of agriculture. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag. That's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil. (laughs) 